All right, everybody, welcome to the show. We have a great episode today. I think they're all pretty great, but I think this one is especially perfect. And we're going to be talking with Dr. Marina Harris about the topic of perfectionism and also sports psychology and how these things are very much tied together and how we deal with it. So a little bit of an intro for Dr. Harris. Dr. Marina Harris is a licensed psychologist, performance consultant, and speaker. As a former Division I gymnast, she understands the unique stressors affecting athletes and performers. Her psychology practice, Bloom Psychology Group, offers individual therapy and sport psychology services for high achievers who want to feel more calm. She also offers a brief 45-minute class, Calm Under Pressure, which helps high performers understand their unique stress response and learn three crucial anxiety management strategies to perform at their peak in high pressure situations. Dr. Harris had a wonderful conversation with me. I was blessed to spend some time with her and I'm hoping to put some of those skills into practice for myself. So hang tight, enjoy this episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I have somebody on the show that I've been wanting to talk to for a while. This is Dr. Marina Harris. I'm going to have her introduce herself, and then we'll kind of jump on in. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. I love to talk, so this is always really fun when I get to do these kinds of projects. Um, I'm Dr. Marina Harris. I'm a licensed psychologist and a mental performance consultant, and I own a psychology practice called Bloom Psychology Group, and I work with very anxious, high achievers, and a lot of times that includes people who are very competitive in athletics or some type of performance like dance, um, music, acting, those types of things, and um, I myself was very competitive in gymnastics growing up. Um, I actually had a scholarship to do Division I college gymnastics, and so really get on a personal level some of that internal pressure and perfectionism, as we'll be talking about today. And so that's, you know, who I end up, up working with. And we really talk about ways to just feel more calm, feel more worthy. Um, while people uh, achieve their goals, so. Cool. The first question, this is gonna be like a pop quiz question, and this applies a little bit to to the show. Um, when was the last time in the Olympics that we had a perfect gymnastics score? Do you remember? Uh, I don't know, I'm just asking you. But <laughs> not off the top of my head, but I feel like Mary Lou Retton yeah, maybe something like that, right? When when was that about? Oh man, the seventies or eighties? <laughs> yeah, so like forty or fifty years ago, something like that, right? Oh my god, first of all, like we're very old yeah. if that was forty or fifty years ago. Um, but that I know it's it's leading into kind of like the topic we want to talk about is perfectionism, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's like this analogy that I use a lot of time with my patients is like these Olympic literal literal Olympic gold medalists are getting not perfect scores, but Olympic gold medalists to bet on the world. So, but let, we'll we'll dive into more of that a little bit, but so let's talk with that. So what is perfectionism? What does that mean? Yeah, I think the term perfectionism is tossed around a lot. Um, The things that we look for, mainly three things, is just like very, very high standards. Um, The second thing is sort of judging your self-worth on your ability to meet those standards, which is like totally a trap. Um, And then the third is you get some kind of negative consequence from it. Yeah. Yeah. How does this show up like in our world, the mental health world? So many ways. Yeah. So many ways. Um, I think perfectionism is really closely rooted in some of the like systemic issues that we face. Things like capitalism and racism and sexism is this idea of being good, you know, a good citizen doing the right things 
um, not deviating from things that society judges as good and fair. Um, and I mean, we really all experience negative consequences from that. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you're saying that you do a lot of the work kind of specifically in perfectionism and how that comes about. So what are some common mis misconceptions about what perfectionism is, what it's not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think a big misconception that people have is sort of the stereotype of the perfectionist is like a young white female, right? One young white thin female. And perfectionism shows up for all of us in many, many, many different ways. And so I think that's a stereotype that's really harmful. Um, you know, a lot of us have perfectionism show up in a variety of different thoughts, behaviors, feelings. And these stereotypes really hold people back from, from healing from perfectionism. Um, I think the other misconception about perfectionism is that it's a good thing. You know, it's praised a lot and there's a reason for it. You know, a lot of perfectionists are extremely high achievers. They are the people that get shit done, right? So, um, for a lot of people, it's really scary and hard to give up because they have this view that if they give up perfectionism, they're going to like become lazy and never do anything amazing again, which is so not the case for these people. Yeah. And then like when we're talking about it, like how does one develop those, right? So when we're talking about like, yeah, how somebody develops perfectionism, where does that come from? I mean, it could be so many different ways. I think, you know, we start with the systemic stuff, right? Is that we all live in a capitalistic society that puts expectations on us as people to do good things, you know, that contribute. Um, and for a lot of people that can show up either in like making money or having families, having a perfectly clean magazine ready house, um, and those types of things. So I think we get a lot of messages from media and, um, sort of these like higher level factors. And then that trickles down and to parents, family members, friends and peers. And usually the story that I hear from most people is that they were praised for it, you know, growing up. Like these kids were labeled as like the good kids, the smart kids the kid that they never had to worry about. And then they start judging themselves based on those labels and really um, take in or internalize this message of needing to always be perfect or needing to always live up to that like vague, very high standard of being good or right or best. Yeah. It's, it's hard, right? Because we, again, like we we're talking about before we, we strive for perfectionism, right? We, we kind of push that agenda yeah. on people. We push that goal for people, right? Yeah. And then when we don't achieve it, whether again, internally achieved or externally achieved or kind of mm -hmm. judged by somebody else, like mm -hmm. then this kind of failure becomes where this all or nothing kind of thinking yeah. occurs and happens. And this leads to so many other, so many other things, right? So many other things like the same sort of mechanisms or the things that keep perfectionism going, the same things are found in like anxiety and depression, right? Like this, like you mentioned, all or nothing thinking, you know, those concepts have threads in these mental health symptoms and conditions that we see. And so for a lot of people, if we can dismantle or change some of those kind of core thinking patterns or core behaviors, they feel a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. How, um, what are some, some types of perfectionism, some ways or some things that show up that you, that you see in your kind of clinical practice and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't really categorize pe perfectionism with any specific subtypes actually. Um, 
mainly because everyone has a different story in terms of how their perfectionism shows up. Uh, like I said, you know, I really think about it in those three things that I, I mentioned before and really just helping people understand how it shows up for them in terms of their like thoughts and behaviors and feelings and beliefs um, in their life. And then we work on really acting opposite to that, you know, doing things that undermine the perfectionism. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that like, I, that I was always kind of intrigued by with this topic was like the whole crossover with like a lot of the psychopathology, right? And how much of this is like a character trait versus like, a disorder versus like right. a personality disorder, right? Because we know so much of like OCD and then OCPD. So like obsessive compulsive disorder, obsessive yeah. compulsive personality disorder, which are kind of colloquially out in the world, kind of used interchangeably. But like we know from our clinical point of view, they're very, very different kind of yeah, things. Um, could you, just for those who may be listening, could you kind of explain the difference between like OCD versus OCPD real kind of briefish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the way we think about OCD is it has the components of people experiencing intrusive thoughts. And when we say intrusive, it's like unwanted, very distressing thoughts or images that feel stuck. You know, they can't get them out of their head. And then some people develop certain behaviors or things that they do in response to these intrusive thoughts in order to try to get them to go away or minimize them. And so, for example, how we think about like classic OCD, right, is someone might have an intrusive or very distressing thought that a loved one is going to die. And so in order to try to prevent that from happening, they might, you know, count or flip a light switch a certain amount of times or check that their car is running correctly or check safety measures. And really what that does is it, you know, helps minimize the distress associated with the thought. And people then really start to believe that their thoughts impact what happens in the real world. Yeah. Okay. And some people with OCD don't have any types of behaviors necessarily, but just have like the really distressing intrusive thoughts. Um, so that's like a different subtype. Whereas OCPD, like whenever we label personality disorders, so obsessive compulsive personality disorder, we're really talking about a pervasive pattern that is long lasting and doesn't change. So we're thinking about people who are adults who have, you know, demonstrated these patterns of thinking and behaving for a very long period of time. And again, the OCPD is really characterized by these like very rigid, um, sort of unrelenting beliefs or standards that are very persistent. So it's almost perfectionism taken to a very, very extreme degree in a way that's really long lasting and causes a lot of problems for people. Yeah. And it's things like they're perfectionistic to the point where like they need to make lists in order to, you know, like the, the, the list making itself becomes its own chore, mm -hmm. right? And it gets away from the ability to like right. do things and it's like, um, what are some other things like being very miserly with like money and things like that. And just kind of like even perfectionism with like moralistic things like, oh my God, like this person who cut me off on the highway is like a total, this person needs to be like in hell right now. And like, it again, becomes this very kind of extreme, extreme kind of things. And I think one of the things that people don't realize is like OCD again, like you were saying before is, is this distressing thing where right? somebody perceives this as like a distress and like, this is weird. This is, ah, this shouldn't be happening. And OCPD is, you know, ego syntonic, right? It's in line with kind of what our, with what our thinking is, is like, Oh, it's, it's not a problem to yourself because this is how you do things. Right. Be but becomes a problem to other people around them who are like, mm -hmm. why are you 
making all these lists and why why are you like chasing this person down on the highway to tell them like why did you cut me off it's like it's like oh because i have to right that's what i need to do so right Right. this is right or moral this is the right thing and this is the wrong thing and i need to let the person know right right right. well and people like another problem i think um that you see with people with ocpd is like extreme criticism of themselves and other people and so that's sometimes where you see the problems come come up is because it's like nothing's ever right nothing's ever perfect compared to their just like extremely high standards and the high standards like you said are moralistic and so if it's not up to that standard it's immediately wrong or bad Um, there's no sort of gray area in between which obviously is so hard to live with you know very hard very hard i see this a lot like with my teen patients right and it's and you know we i'm i'm based in northern virginia we're outside of like you know dc and it's you know the number one and two richest counties in america where like i work and where most of my kiddos come from and you see this kind of like push to be like well you have to go and become like a doctor or a lawyer and you have to have like a 4.7 gpa which is like i was like first of all how do you have a 4.7 gpa <laughs> kids these days right um but they have something or other but they have to do this and they have to have like internships and they need to be doing you know these this constant resume like creation yes how much of this is like internal versus kind of external pressures and then how does how do these things become internalized and then kind of the effects of this right because i i see again a lot of them struggling with anxiety and become suicidal from it because like Mm -hmm. again they they didn't get into the college that they wanted to get into or they didn't get enough of a scholarship and then like i'd rather not live and i'm like whoa like they're we're getting to this big extreme level so yeah where does that kind of come from you think or Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about it earlier. I think one thing that our field doesn't do super well, and I'm guilty of this as a psychologist, is we don't consider how these sort of larger systemic factors affect individual functioning. And so we're really seeing it now with this younger generation is like more information, more expectations, more competitiveness. Um, and I see the same thing. I work with a lot of teenagers and I see these brilliant teenagers who work their, like, you know, work themselves so hard to do well and go to college. And, you know, they, these schools are so competitive now that kids who are brilliant, so smart, super well-rounded are not getting into their, you know, top choices or they're only getting into their safe schools. And, um, or not getting in and it's really devastating and it's um, it's really disappointing as a society that that's sort of where we're at um, where even people who are like amazing talented wonderful are not getting the opportunities that they that they want to get um, and so I think you know, it's a mistake to think that perfectionism is an individual problem when it's really a systemic problem. And obviously as individual providers, you know, we're treating the individual. And so there is a level of work where we do, it's like, okay, let's think about this differently or let's like give yourself compassion and all of those great things. But we also need to understand that society right now is not taking care of its youth by setting up these like really unrealistic expectations for them. So on that kind of like on that wavelength, how how can what can society do better? What can we as like the adults, I guess, right? Somewhat adults, like and parents and I'm an adult. Know, what? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I pretend to not be so, a lot of the times, and then I get in trouble for it. But <laughs> <laughs> what can we do for you know? We were talking about like our kids earlier a little bit, but like, what can we do to help them out so that these societal pressures are not there as much, or parental pressures are not there as much? Yeah, I mean, these are obviously small examples, but things like encouraging your children to derive their self-worth from their inherent self, right? And not their achievements. Um, Avoiding labels of like, 
oh, you're so smart or you're so good and more commenting on the process of things that kids do. Like, wow, I know that, you know, math was something that didn't come easily to you. And I just saw you work so hard throughout the year to stay on top of things and study for tests. And like, I'm so proud of you for putting in that effort, right? So things like that, that are not related to just the end goal or achievement, but we're actually encouraging our children to focus on the process of things. And the other thing, this is getting a little into parenting, but the thing that I always want to tell parents is that your kids watch everything that you do. They pick up on everything. And so if you're not doing this with yourself, they know about it and they internalize it. So not making comments like, oh, my house is so dirty. I need to clean it. And that makes me a bad mom. Or, oh my gosh, Karen's kids have beautiful snacks or whatever it is, like not comparing yourself to other people and not comparing your kids to other people are the little things that we can do to model to them how we, you know, strive less for these like high unrealistic standards. Um, Damn that Karen nurse snacks. I know. They're... I know. <laughs> The perfectly ruled up ones like the, they come in the little bento boxes like on instagram and like you know yeah very healthy nothing's packaged right except like nothing's right. art, you know, packaged in plastic and you right. know that's okay right. right we can we can sometimes it's okay to send the kids to school with like leftover pizza wrapped in mm -hmm. aluminum foil and a bag of chips right it's totally okay yeah totally okay and like really good for them to not moralize food as yeah. good or bad, right? Like food is energy and sometimes food is fun and that's all it has to be. It doesn't need to be anything that has meaning about your worth as a person. So yeah. I feel yeah. pretty strongly about that. Oh yeah. And I know like, I mean, yeah, one of the things that you're just saying too about like um, modeling for the parents or par modeling for the kids by parents, like, you know, one of the things that I'm sure that you see and come across is like screen time stuff, right? And it's hard to kind of really enforce or push or talk about screen time limits when we're on our own phones or when we're on our own computers and, and TV and stuff like that too, right? So. Yep. yep. And there are lots of, again, moralizing you know, if you allow your kids to be on screens at a certain age, or if you allow them a, past a certain amount of time on screens, it makes you a bad parent or you're a lazy parent. And frankly, I think that's a lot of BS. I think it's, it's a lot bullshit. of us need to do <laughs> what works for ourselves and our families. Um, and sometimes that is doing that. Yeah. Um, no, I know that YouTube has played their played a role in raising my kids but it's, it's good and bad too a little bit <laughs> oh yeah we're a firm miss rachel family so <laughs> um and you know what like i'll i'll say that i do i do that with myself you know i i often feel guilty about giving my daughter screen time because i know that um you know there's studies out there about um, the effects or like the benefits of not having screens at an early age and certain things happen in my family. Like, uh, recently my daughter has had terrible, um, time with like changing. And the only way I can change her is by, you know, allowing her to watch Miss Rachel while we do that. And I'm sure that there are people out there who are going to say that I'm horrible for doing that. And like, I would so much rather my kid not have these horrific, unpleasant associations with like changing her clothes because we're fighting the entire time because she finds it like horribly, horribly unpleasant. Um, and obviously like we're going to work on not doing that forever. And sometimes it's about letting go of what you feel like you should do for what is functional in your family and in yourself. Yeah. And I think it's like the, the discussion as a whole, right? Is that everything is, individualized there's nuance and everything like there's there's you know it's like these these guidelines that are out there it's like they're not law like nobody should be in jail because of this or in facebook jail because of like oh my god 
Dr. Harris is letting her kids watch Miss Rachel. Like, no, that <laughs> doesn't mean anything. So. Right, right. Well, and, you know, I firmly say that, like, well, and I guess we know from shame, shame research that shame, like the feelings that we have when we feel like we're not perfect or we don't live up to some standard, those feelings thrive in darkness, right? And secret. And so a lot of times we're encouraging people to like connect with other moms or parents who are also struggling and to be vulnerable with people you trust so that you get human connection. And so like in that way, we really have to practice what we preach and do, do the same thing. So yeah, don't come for me cause I watch Miss <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> but even if you do, I stand by it. So. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all good. Yeah. We've gone through, we've gone through like all the phases of like the YouTubers and like, you know, little yeah. Ryan, little Ryan Kaji and the, the, the billionaire YouTuber kiddo who plays with toys. But like, we've gone through all of those guys too. Yeah. So yeah, your yeah. daughter will get there. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, I had something, right. It was, um, how do we practice like self-compassion with this? Mm-hmm. Like how, how do we kind of forgive ourselves? I think this is the, clinically when I'm working with people, right? This is the thing that becomes like the, like, I just can't do it. I just can't let myself, I can't forgive myself for this. Like if I, you know, take a 30 minute break and even though it makes me feel better, I will have lost 30 minutes of work Mm. that I've been able to do. And I can't forgive myself for that. How do we deal with that? It is so hard. Yeah. Um, because I think especially for perfectionists or, you know, kids who are anxious or depressed, like, self-compassion is very inaccessible. Um, especially when we pair it with like the toxic positivity of like, love yourself, you're amazing. And like, that's just not realistic or accessible for a lot of people. And so really encourage people to just start really small is like, it's like, man, I am really bummed that I didn't get to sweep under my kid's high chair today. And I don't like it, but that's what's happening right now. (laughs) You know, like starting with some like statements around acceptance and knowing that it's okay to not do the things that you always want to do. Um, And really working on just challenging those expectations. Um, I recently read a book that um, I I'm obsessed with actually, and I don't have any, um, (laughs) financial stake. I just am a fan. So it's called How to Keep House While Drowning. Um, I think it's by Casey Davis, who's an LPC. But the way that she frames it is amazing because the book is about care tasks, right? Like, um, you know, cleaning, organizing, and how we moralize those things. Um, Like how we expect to have a picture perfect home. And if we don't do that, we're failing. Um, but I think it's really applicable to a lot of different things. Um, and so she talks about how, like, we don't exist to serve our space, but our space exists to serve us. And so I think about it similarly, like you do not exist to serve these expectations, your expectations and your life exist to serve you in some way. And so she talks a lot about like, making your life functional, making it work. And I just think it's so accessible. It's very um, easy to start that way Um, in terms of like changing your behaviors to make it easier on yourself than to work on changing like the thoughts and the beliefs because that stuff is so ingrained in us. Um, But highly recommend that book if you're struggling with self-compassion because I just like absolutely loved it. Nice. We'll yeah. we'll try to like make sure that's the right author and give a give a link down in the bottom and yeah, then I'll sure. see if I can get some money out of it from <laughs> some links. But no, um, <laughs> yeah, there's no financial interest. I'm just a fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll find a way to try to get the hustle on it, but don't worry. <laughs> um, you've, we've talked. I mean, like when we're talking about this, I'm hearing a lot of like this CBT ish stuff. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thoughts, behaviors, and the emotions. Talk to us about that and I guess and I know that you have a, a course yourself that you kind of 
oh. go over. Um, I don't want to like steal your course in a way or steal the secrets of your course, but a little, a little something about that aspect of it and those, those connections, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, um, I realize when I, when I think about perfectionism, I think about it a lot as like a CBT related perspective. Although I'm almost like a recovering CBT -er because I'm much more in line with like the process based cognitive behavioral frameworks from a, you know, acceptance and commitment standpoint. And so from that aspect, a lot of it is about again, not moralizing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but looking at them very curiously with non-judgment and saying, like, instead of saying, oh my God, I'm so horrible for having this thought. Why do I beat myself up all the time? God, I shouldn't be doing that. Instead being like, huh, I'm noticing I'm having this thought that I'm like really being mean to myself for not wiping under my daughter's high chair. Like, I wonder why that's going on, you know, and just realizing that like, they are just thoughts, they're just feelings, that they don't have to cause a ton of distress, right? Just because we have a thought doesn't make it true or doesn't mean that it's going to cause something to happen in our lives. And it's really all about like living your life in a way that is important and meaningful to you. And so like for me, me having mean thoughts about myself is like not the life I want to live. Like that's not meaningful to me. Um, and it doesn't help me build a meaningful life. And so we really want to think about, again, like, making things serve you rather than like you serving the thoughts or even like, um, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. That works. And then I know one thing that was like also in here was like the healthy striving versus perfectionism. Perfectionism. I know we talked about that like a little bit, but coming back to that a little bit more, how do we kind of like work these things and finding the balance between them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Um, yeah. it's something that it's what we call an, you know, iterative process. Like there's a lot of trial and error. And so part of it is like a willingness to try something different. Um, so I'd say like really starting there is like accepting and noticing that these are happening and being willing to experience something different, even when it doesn't feel perfectly right. You know, being willing to experience the uncomfortable feelings that come up when you don't wipe under your kid's high chair, but noting that like that allows you to do something else that's really important to you, like sitting down and resting or, you know, reading a book that you like or like really focusing on spending time with your kid, like how much more meaningful that is. Um, so definitely think that's, that's one thing. Um, Really, the other thing I encourage people to do is to really adjust expectations that are, are flexible and not so rigid, like avoiding all of those really black and white words, like always, never, have to, must, and really working on, like you said, finding the nuance and the gray area and knowing that like we can still strive and try with out basing our self-worth on our achievements. Like I can know that I'm enough even when I don't sweep under my kid's high chair, you know, every time she eats or when I don't have a good day at work, like I am still a worthy human being even when I'm experiencing uncomfortable feelings or I don't get the achievements that I want. Um, so that is a really big aspect of it. Uh, I think the thing I want to tell listeners is this stuff takes time. You know, you're not going to leave this podcast and be like, I am worthy. Like, um, although I hope you do like that's Wish, awesome. Yeah. yeah. yeah great. Um, <laughs> but it takes time to develop and you got to give yourself time to learn it, you know, just like you've learned to give yourself these high standards for, you know, 30 years of your life or however long you need to unlearn those things and you need to develop new patterns. And 
that takes time and effort and practice. And, you know, I'm still doing it. And I'm an yeah. expert, technically. <laughs> Quote unquote. Quote unquote. <laughs> I think I'm an expert. <laughs> somebody, somebody calls me an expert, right? So. Yeah, right. Well, and that's the thing about perfectionism is you've yeah. ne- you never feel like you've arrived, right? Mm-hmm. Which is part of part of the problem. Like you never feel like enough. And that's the thing that I really love about values versus goals is like, you never arrive at your value. It's like going north. You know, you always, you can always go in the direction of north, but you never arrive in the north, but you can always sort of take steps to cultivate a meaningful life and feel good in your life. And a lot of people can't do that when they're married to perfectionism because perfectionism is like an abusive partner that is really mean and it's just hard. It's too hard. Perfectionism sucks, right? Uh, from from that point of view, in regards yeah. to like, it, it becomes mean, it becomes terrible, and I don't think we you had talked about it a little bit earlier. Like it it grows in silence almost, or it becomes this thing, and then again, we see so many people who become clinically depressed or clinically anxious or develop like OCD kind of tendencies and qualities and come from it and cope with it in all different kinds of ways, right? Substances or other things that are destructive. And and I think it's this, you know, we, we think of it really cutely like, oh, perfectionism is like, oh, it's like this quality and it's a trait, but like it can become really problematic when it's left unchecked and really kind of pushed on people so much and then really, yeah, it really becomes right. a huge problem. Right. Well, and just like anything, you know, some you know, we have a continuum of any kind of personality trait and perfectionism might fall on the like conscientious, maybe personality trait. And so like, you know, conscientiousness in itself is not a bad thing. It's really when it's just taken to the extreme and then it's done over years and years and years of learning um, and years and years and years of beating ourselves up for it. Yeah. Um, One other thing I wanted to mention, um, a framework that I really like for, for perfectionism is the idea of learning how to do like bottom up decision making versus top down. And, um, one of my mentors at Duke university uh, taught me this. Her name is Noka Zerubavel and she's a trauma specialist and she's just like an incredible human being who I love. Um, but This It's this idea that perfectionism is sort of this top-down process where we start with the rules and expectations, and then we apply them to ourselves really rigidly, like sort of thoughts and feelings and situations be damned. So it's like, you know, I have to get this done, and even if I'm sick or injured or my kid gets called out of daycare or whatever, like I have to do this, and so I apply these standards to myself no matter what versus more of a bottom up processing, which is like feeling first is like, how am I feeling? What's going on inside right now? And how can I like move towards my expectations based on how I'm doing? So it's really like, okay, well, my expectation for today was to Um, I don't know, maybe like answer 10 emails, but I don't feel great. And so based on that, I'm going to do something else instead, right? So more of this like feeling first, which is extremely alien to a lot of perfectionists. Um, And it's important because you can still achieve a lot, but not feel so bad doing it. Yeah, and it's it's the old adage, right? We get with a lot of again, like when I'm working with a lot of teens, it's who don't, you know, they don't turn in the homework that's not perfect, right? And right. and I say to them, well, getting a fifty on a test is a lot better, or the assignment is better than getting a zero, and they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> and it's it's hard to kind of challenge that because it becomes so ingrained. But we're yeah. able to kind of from the outside look at it and be like, yeah, fifty percent is better than zero percent. So. Do what we can do, right? We try. We try to get there and push that. Push that as much as we can. Right. 
Right. And sometimes they have to come to that realization on their own, right? Like sometimes as either therapists or psychiatrists or adults, we, we can tell them that and we can encourage them, but they need to have experiences that help them learn that in their own way. So usually then those kids get to college and they're like, Oh, okay. This is, this is it. This is why, why we were talking about that. And they yeah. can, can come to it in their own way. Yeah. It's almost like kind of a, a, a gradual exposure yes. that we have to do to kind of get people to that point yes. kind of even coming back to like you know like you're saying cleaning under the the, ar- the high chair and stuff like that like we've got to force it like just be like yeah. purposely like don't clean under it for today and see what happens right does your right. baby you know does like do they fall down and start licking under the chair no <laughs> like these things will be it'll be okay like hopefully no not, right? she got hungry and then yeah. ate the goldfish off the floor and was really happy and yeah whatever you know nothing happened right Right. so (laughs) right exactly yeah those behavioral experiments are are super important um to be like yeah actually like things are okay if it's not perfect like yeah nobody loves you any less you didn't (laughs) die you know like the feelings are uncomfortable but they're tolerable yeah yeah pivoting a bit um, I know one of the other reasons I wanted to talk was like sports psychology, sports psychiatry, sports athlete mental health. I know we're doing like the little dance because I was like, it's interesting because we're we both are like in the athlete mental health field, right? Yeah. Um, I'm you know one of the things that I do but I don't get to talk so much about is like I'm part of the National Basketball Players Association mental health and wellness program. So like after Demar Derozan, Kevin Love, and those guys like talked out about like you know, NBA player mental health, like this was an initiative that was launched and I'm there for like the Washington Wizards as like a person that they can talk to. And then through the Players Association, I'm not through the NBA. So like they come to my practice as a client of mine versus like I'm the team affiliated or league affiliated doctor who answers to the league. So it's a nice kind of little extra privacy, extra separation. But it's interesting because like online, people don't talk about this as much, right? Because people are like, oh, athlete mental health, whatever. Nobody cares about these people. Like there's almost like this lack of like lack of, I don't want to say like um, pity or lack of kind of like empathy. Like compassion. Compassion. Yeah, yeah sure. that's the word. That's mm-hmm. the word, right? This yep. is my Ramadan, Ramadan brain talking. Lack of compassion for athletes because they're like, oh, these are like NBA players. Like what do they have to worry about? Right. Like what do they care about? Like athletes are the best people in the world. Like what do they have? What's wrong with them? Right. But <laughs> And I'm sure that you kind of, and when we we were messaging, actually, that's something that you were kind of saying that, like, I don't get to talk about this. People don't, there's no audience for it almost. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Like I'm part of like your background with it. And I know you talked about being, you know, D1 gymnast and everything. And like, obviously like I'm Pakistani and I can't go to the NBA because there's no brown people out in the NBA where, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I have to, I have to get to the NBA by being a doctor, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but (laughs) you, you did the damn thing, right? You were, you were a gymnast, you're a D1 athlete gymnast. So talk about that a little bit and go from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually was really lucky because I, so I was recruited by West Virginia University and ended up going there and they have a very rare undergraduate degree in sport and exercise psychology. And I really went there, I mean, partly for obviously for gymnastics, but that was one of the reason I, I chose West Virginia over a different program that was recruiting me because I, I knew I was interested in, in sports psychology. Um, we had a sports psychologist come when I was in high school and I think I didn't take full advantage of it at the time. Um, but I, you know, got started early in my undergrad career and I had a career ending injury actually. So I, I didn't end up competing, um, for West Virginia. Cause I, after my freshman year, the doctors were like, you can't do this anymore. Um, and so, um, I ended up getting a master's degree in sports psychology and, um, and then do my doctorate in clinical psych and just again, like was overwhelmed time and time again with stories on the news about athlete mental health. Um, my discussion with friends and teammates about how these sort of like sport cultures affected mental health. 
Um, obviously perfectionism is rampant, but other things like just like pressure and, uh, fatigue and the physical side of things, like it's so challenging at that level. And, you know, I just knew that that was something I wanted to do. And it's just the funnest thing in the world. I think, um, you know, athletes, as a population, talk about mental health significantly less than their non-athlete peers. They seek counseling less. Um, they want people who are labeled as, you know, sport psychologists or people who have experience in sport because um, they're much more comfortable with their peers. And so it's just so rewarding to get someone who's like not interested in talking about feelings or, you know, not not willing or not wanting to be vulnerable and then helping show them the power of doing these things and then see them like totally thriving and flourishing and doing amazing. I just find that to be so much fun. So, yeah, it's, it's really cool because like one of the things that got me into it, like I'm, you know, people who follow me like on Twitter and stuff may see that like, mm. I'm like a huge wrestling fan, right? Professional wrestling fan. And, you know, I was growing up as like, you know, growing up with the Hulk Hogan's and the ultimate warriors and all these guys, Razor Ramones and stuff. And then you see what was happening to them as they would get older, right? You would see all the stuff that they would get into. And then I think there was like these, these terrible statistics or some, somebody was like saying like everybody from like WrestleMania one is dead or everyone from like WrestleMania two and three is like dead because they've had substance issues or steroids or suicide or all these things. And you're just like, Oh my God, like there is, what is going on with these people? Like, and then that's how I got into the whole field of like athlete mental health about because again we, we have these ideas of like what they go through or what they don't go through more so and that's that's so incorrect and so wrong so incorrect yeah and you know then when i was at doing my training like at at university of baltimore like the guy who literally wrote the book on sports psychiatry dr mcduff um david mcduff he was over there and he was like the head of the addictions fellowship and i was like i was like doing some research and some googling or something like that and i was like what the hell this guy's like you know down down the office for me like i was like let me just like pop in and like see what i can do and i was able to do some stuff with like with some athletes locally and i was like like you're saying it's great um because you get to see and you get to ex get to expose to so many so many different things and so many different people yeah so when yeah. you're doing it and you're doing the sports work or when you're working with athletes, what is, what is it that you're doing, I guess, right? What is, what do we do versus like, mm -hmm. what do people think that we do, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what people <laughs> think that we do, but so I hear so many people say, well, what's a sports psychologist? Yeah. And what is I, a sports psychologist? We'll start with that then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just tell people, you know, I help athletes and performers perform their best more often. You know, in, in doing that, however that looks for, for somebody. Um, but I think a lot of it is number one, having a space to talk about and process their athletic experience with someone who might have an idea about what they're going through. Um, obviously I get a lot of like kudo points for being a college gymnast, but that doesn't mean that I know every athlete's unique experience, like far from it. And so part of it is coming in with some humility of like, you're expert on you and your sport. I'm coming in with this level of expertise, but like, let's work together to help you figure out what works for you in your sport and in your life. Um, and I lean a lot, again, on the mindfulness acceptance skills and working with athletes on, on their values. You know, what do you want to be remembered for as an athlete and as a person? Um, what makes your life and your career meaningful? And how do we show up and do that regardless of the outcome? Meaning, like, regardless of whether you win or lose, can we still... Like, if you tell me you care about being an encouraging teammate or you want to be a leader, like, you know, can we still give your teammate three positive comments in a game, regardless of if you're winning or losing? Can we be more vocal, you know, when you're out there and how that transforms your game? 
you know, rather than really focusing too much on, on the outcome of, of what's going on. Yeah. When with athletes too, it's really hard because again, like it comes down to you we're, we're being measured by winning and losing, right? You, you won, you lost, or you performed, you didn't lose or you performed or you didn't perform. And that's hard because there's mentally there's this huge toll on people right and then you know we, we we're seeing it more so in the last couple of years with um naomi osaka dropping out of like the tennis simone biles pulling out of the olympics kind of aspect so people are able to talk about it a little bit more um how do we rec reconcile that and i know we were talking about perfectionism and then like i know like we we're saying a bit about like the process of it but when it becomes so black and white, <laughs> you won, you lost, right? How do we deal with that? What are some of the skills, I guess, that you use in that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is really focusing on the process and things that athletes can control. Um, you know, so maybe it's developing anxiety management strategies you know, at certain key points in performance, or maybe at certain instructional statements or cues that they're, you know, relaying in their head. And, you know, what that does is like, you're telling your body exactly what you want it to do. And you're much more likely to get the outcome of winning, right? If you're focused on like the things you need to do to execute an, ama an amazing dive or free throw, right? Um, so really focusing on, on the controllables and again, like deriving self-worth from your inherent being as a person and not whether you're winning or losing a game or what people are saying about you. I think the other piece that I'm sure you run into all the time with NBA players is like everything that they do and say is on display and we know what exposure does and like credit, like widespread criticism does to people. And it's, it's so hard. And I think that lay people like, well, I'm referring to myself as a, as a lay person because I wasn't a professional athlete, but I don't think we can understand that. Like, I, I don't think we can ever really comprehend what that's like for people and it affects people in different ways. And so if we can help them, do things that they care about and, and really helping them like unhook themselves from caring about winning at all costs. You know, we can really, really make some changes um, and get people feeling better. Yeah. I think we get like a taste of it because we have like some social media following, right? We have like a decent -ish kind of social media following in, in some places. Right. <laughs> And it's like, you know, there's there's always the people, like I think we have this negativity bias, right? When somebody says something critical, we we throw out the hundred positive comments of like, oh, such a great article. And we focus on the one person that's like, that was such trash. Like, how mm -hmm. can you say that, right? Yeah. And then we multiply that by millions. Thousands, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thousands, yeah. millions yeah. to like when we're talking about professional athletes or any kind of athletes and the rabid kind of fandoms that are there. And we see this, right? We see like people are sending out death threats, right? People are sending out kind of like they're threatening family members, right? They're, that can happen with, again, professional sports or national sports or anything else like that. So right. it's really hard to separate, again, and, and those things and kind of have that, right. that bias, that filter that's there. Right. Well, and that adds to the pressure, right? Like an athlete isn't going to believe it's just the game if after they lose their family gets death threats. Right. And how patronizing for us to talk like that when like there are very real pressures um, that they face around around that. Um, so, again, like as sports fans, what we need to do is really not contribute to that in the things that we say online and to other people and to athletes and about athletes. Um, I had a realization this year, I turned 30 and we love college sports. And so I'm like watching college sports and 
like up until this point, I'm like, oh yeah, they're my age. And then I had this moment where I was like, oh my God, they're kids. Like they're, the, not, right? <laughs> they're kids. They're yeah. just trying to like go through life and figure it out. And then they have this huge platform. And so especially with like March Madness, you know, and oh, people yeah. are seeing these horrific things about college students. It's like, that's a young adult who's like, just trying to get through school and has so much pressure. So I think us as fans have a responsibility also to not contribute to that critical culture um, yeah. and take responsibility for how we perpetuate that in a lot of ways. Yeah. These are like, again, we, we say it like, you know, the brain's developing until they're 25 and like, and like these, these kids are like 18, 22 in that range or whatever. And like, you know, I have patients that are plenty of patients that are there. I love working with that age students. And it's like, you want them to, to be, you know, representing millions of people and like be like the, the goat or the, or the, what's it called? Like the, the Billy goat forever, or whatever, like the failure for these people. Like it doesn't right. work like that. Right. It's just, right. it's a ridiculous amount of pressure on them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You had said something for, for yourself. You had had a, a career ending injury mm -hmm. and sorry to hear that first of all um hopefully it's all healed up and good to go now who knows whatever right sort of yeah sort of <laughs> <laughs> um but it's it's one of those other aspects right is because when you're an athlete to uh, for a lot of people for fans right mm -hmm. you're good when you're there and then when you're not there you're nothing out of out of sight out of mind yep. right and a lot of times, you know, I work with people who have injuries and then they struggle to get back or they can't come back or mm -hmm. their careers are done. And it's really that development of the person, the athlete as individual, right? Who are you aside yeah. from the athlete? Yeah. What kind of stuff do you do to work on that development of self? Mm. All kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, all kinds of things. Um, one, I'll say one intervention I really like is almost to think about yourself as like a pie chart, right? So if you think about a pie chart, there's like a hundred percent of whatever that makes up you. And sometimes I'll have athletes delineate like, okay, what percentage of you is taken up by sport or how you think about yourself is, is related to sport and what are the other things? And a lot of times people have these really lopsided pie charts. It's like 80% of how I think about myself is, is through my sport. But I also really like X, Y, Z, but they're only taking up like 5% of the pie chart. And so we talk about ways to like make the things that you care about outside of sport take up bigger space in your chart. Um, you know, how do we make more time for leisure activities? How do we um, change how you think about yourself? you know, not just as an athlete, but as a well-rounded person. And like, what are the other things that we need to give time and thought and energy to? Um, and then of course, you know, helping athletes understand and label their core values and do behaviors that are consistent with that, whether that's related to sport or other things. Um, and so, you know, those are just two examples of oops, some really fun things that, that we can do. But again, it's totally different for each athlete. You know, some athletes are like, I'm so relieved I'm done. And others yeah. uh, really struggle with it. Yeah, that, that anxiety of being out in the public and, again, the pressures that come with it are, for a lot of people, are too much, right? Or they're, they're enough to kind of drive them out of it. Um, yeah. How, what are some ways I know, what are some ways for people who want to work with athletes, what can they do or how do they approach athletes to really help them out in psychology, psychiatry stuff? Yeah. I mean, I would say like, get your training, you know, make sure that you're doing things that are consistent with your ethical codes for whatever type of professional you are. For psychologists, it's like you have to have, you know, education, um, training or experience in order to be competent in something. So 
you know, if you don't have any experience in sport, seek out some CEs, you know, be supervised by somebody who does. Um, and I think it's just really important to connect with local organizations, um, talk to people who are in, in sport, coaches, young athletes, organizational leaders. Um, you know, it's not about meeting with the top professional athletes. If you really care about athletes in sport, you know, if we think about sport as an iceberg, the professionals are the tip of the iceberg, really. And so sometimes it's about really starting with the local areas in your community and how you can impact athlete mental health. Um, there are a couple organizations that are really good to get involved in. Um, I think the big one is uh, the American Psychological Association has a Division 47, which is a subset that is dedicated to sport and performance. And um, there's also the Association of Applied Sports Psychology, which certifies mental performance consultants and has a process for taking classes, getting supervised hours um, to get that extra certification. Um, and I think those are the two big ones. I know that there is a emerging social work organization for social workers who are involved in sport. Um, and so I definitely encourage people to just get involved with other professionals who are doing the types of things that they want to be doing. Yeah. And I think it's really important too, that people hear that part in the beginning about like athletes are at all levels, right? You're just, cause you think you're going to go into sports psych, like it doesn't mean you're going to work in the NBA or the NFL. Like right. I've been, I've been begging <laughs> the, the Washington commanders now they are like to be like, cause I, drive by their training facility every day on the way to work. And I'm like, you guys have enough fucked up things going on in your organization. Like, it sounds like you need some help. Um, can I please help you guys? And it's, it, you know, those those emails, those reaches out go unanswered a lot of times. Right. And it's like, you know, it's don't expect that you're just going to like end up on these levels and these stages because you're going to do this stuff. Like, again, yeah. starting off at the high school level, you know, when you're working with your teenage patients or your college age patients and they they may be doing a sport like that's the first kind of in right like mm -hmm. just kind of being like oh right. tell me about your sport tell me about like yeah. how that's going and like yeah. and if that's something that kind of intrigues you like mm -hmm. that's how you get into it a little bit more right right yeah like tell me about how sport impacts your identity to what extent do you want that to be involved in our conversations right like those types of questions. And, um, yeah, I think a lot of people are really interested in sports psychology. Well, I won't speak for people, but I've seen, you know, professionals who like to, to name drop around like the clout of working with a certain level of athlete. And I, I really just encourage people to drop that as an aspect of our profession, you know, this profession is thankless, and I think in a lot of ways that's problematic, and we really need to do it for the reasons of helping our people, like our individual clients, rather than um, doing so to fuel like our need for worth or our egos or our sense of self. And I, I know a lot of people get into sports psychology because they were an athlete, and they want to do that. And so I usually really encourage people to sort of like do self work as they get into that as like coming to terms with their identity outside of sport before working with other athletes so that, you know, they're not also like wrapped in working with athletes to affirm their own identities and things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's a complicated field because again, like anybody who's working with quote unquote people of note i guess you could say mm -hmm. it's like where is this what is the drive for this where is this coming from right and mine was just because i've been a lifelong fan and i've had yeah. some desire for seeing something that was a, a, a need that was not being met so right. that's right. where it kind of just came from when it's a huge need you know yeah. there are so many mental health positions open in sport they need people who are trained both in mental health and in the sports psychology side of things. You know, those positions often go um, un, unfilled, you know, so we definitely need need people. So if you're a mental health professional who's interested in sport, 
absolutely encourage you to, to get involved. And um, I'll make a selfish plug. Um, I do have a sort of calm under pressure course available, which includes um, three sort of anxiety management skills that I use with athletes. Um, and it talks about that in a sport related context. Um, and so obviously if you, you want your own, you know, um, feelings of calm under pressure. You can use those skills, but I think it also helps frame like how to deliver it, you know, in a way that's applicable to athletes. So, yeah, and we'll definitely link that off in the description notes so you can definitely follow up on that. Awesome. Thanks. Any kind of like on this topic, mm -hmm. any kind of like parting things or takeaways from the sports psych world? Um, I think, again, to use the same analogy, it's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the I've been in this field now for, uh, I guess, I guess if you count my undergrad, like almost 13 years, and there is so much more that we know and so much more that we're talking about and then still so much more to go. And so I think it's really exciting because it's in its infancy and there's so much more work that can be done and meaningful change that can happen. And so I'm always really excited about the prospect of, you know, helping the younger generations build their worth in ways that are not tied to their achievements, whether that's sport or other things. And I, I just think that's so meaningful um, and you know, that's the kind of world I want to leave for my kids and my clients. So, yeah, I think that's a great kind of like point is that like this, this field is brand new. Um, we're, we're making it up kind of as we go <laughs> along. Um, and, you know, people who are interested in like being leaders in the field, like this is an opportunity to really be a leader in the field if you're getting in there. And again, I think we're seeing this as that like with the people that the athletes that have been speaking out um, and, and kind of taking care for themselves like that those those bridges are kind of getting built and people are mm -hmm. bringing awareness to it so right right absolutely yeah awesome. all right well i'll be respective of everybody's time so we'll end up on we're gonna try to do two last questions um the one question i ask everybody and then we're gonna add a, a new one just because i'm trying to like get some kind of something going on with this podcast i guess right um <laughs> But um, what are your self-care? Because I know we talk about it with perfectionism and sports psych and everything like that, but self-care, what kind of things do you do for yourself? Oh, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am very self-critical, so surprise, I have trouble with that. Um, one thing that I'm really focusing on is um, radical rest and like thinking about what radical rest looks like. Like, you know, what would it look like for me to rest fully and completely today? And usually that still um, means I'm doing some kind of work, right? Because to me, even when I strive for radical and complete rest, I don't really get there because I work as coping a lot of the time. Um, but that's something I, I think about as a framework. And so um, a lot of times it's me asking myself the question of like, okay, I have 15 minutes or I have 30 minutes. What do I need right now? Um, what do I need most right now? And maybe it's that I need to eat. Maybe it's a nap. Maybe it's, oh, I really need to like get this note done or send this email because that's going to make me feel better later. But also thinking about it, I think this is stolen from the book I mentioned from Casey Davis is like, what would be a kindness to my future self? And sometimes it's what's a kindness to my right now self. Um, so that's sort of the framework I'm working in. And um, I'm also toying around with the idea of having like a brave girl summer <laughs> and doing things that really scare me and being brave and taking risks because I am not a risk taker. And so I'm trying to think about what that's going to look like too. So stay tuned. I think we could all use a brave girl or brave boy summer. So I think so too. Yeah. We need some time off. Okay. Yeah. Last dish kind of question is what is your favorite pair of sneakers? <gasps> oh man. Um, right now I have like a pair of soda sneakers that have a little zip on the side. Yeah. But I'm not a sneaker head. Ah. Uh. We got to get everybody, we got to make everybody a sneakerhead. So I we're know. trying. Sorry. That's okay. 
Um, <laughs> how can for people who are interested and want to follow follow along with you in your life and your teachings and stuff? How can how can we follow along with you? Yeah. Um, probably the biggest or the area I'm most accessible on is Twitter. Um, I update that the most often, but I also have a newsletter. Um, it's on Substack, so it's well, I'll let you post the link, but um, it's called Bloom Psychology Group Newsletter. Uh, I also write a popular blog on Psychology Today called Letters from Your Therapist, and it's all about my, you know, musings about the therapy process. And um, those are probably the places where I write the most. If anyone has questions for me, you can always contact me through my website. That works. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Harris, thank you so, so, so much. I know this is like something both I think both of us wanted to talk about for a bit. So yeah. very glad that we're able to get this. And thank you again. Me too. Thanks so much for having me.